All right, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone to, again, the ninth annual Soil School. Um, I'm Scott Gall. I work for West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, I want to just give a shout out to the 80 soil enthusiasts that are joining us on this beautiful, fabulous, wonderful, sunny day to talk about soils and the importance of soils. Uh, that's really exciting. Um, so, um, again, uh, Welcome. Uh, this uh, event is co-hosted. There's two soil and water conservation districts that work together to put on soil school every year. Like I said, I work for West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, we are we're hosting a series with our partner Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District, which is uh, uh, oversees Washington County. So uh, a little bit about us. West Multnomah's mission is to provide resources and information and expertise to inspire people and actively improve our air and water quality, fish and wildlife habitat, and of course, soil health. We serve residents of Western Multnomah County, Salvi Island, and a portion of the Bonnie Slope neighborhood, which is actually in Washington County, but still part of our service district, uh, with conservation planning, weed management, native plants, wildlife habitat restoration, and school gardens. Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District's mission, similar to ours, is to create a sustainable, productive, and healthy environment for the Washington County, Oregon community. We serve residents of the county by providing educational opportunities and advice about natural resource conservation and financial assistance for conservation pro projects. Um, if anyone is interested in additional information from, from the districts, please uh, visit our website and look for contact information. And I'll try to share that in the chat later for some uh, general information. Uh, before we begin, uh, we believe it's important to acknowledge the indigenous people whose land we are utilizing today. The Clackamas Chinook and Willamette Tumwater, the Wasco Wushram, the Watlata, the Multnomah, and other Chinookan people, as well as the Tualatin Kalapuya, the Cayuse, and the Malala, the Yakima, and other tribes and bands of the Columbia and Willamette Rivers. It is important to acknowledge these original habitats of the land that falls within our service area, now known as, as City of Portland, Salvi Island, and the Tualatin Mountains. We further recognize that, is in, that we are here because of the land displacement, cultural erasure, and other sacrifices that were forced upon them. We also remind ourselves that we are guests of this land and must do our best to honor the original people through authentic cultural narratives and continue caring and giving to the soil, air, water, plants, animals, and ecosystems that make up this land community. To follow this acknowledgement with action, we will pursue impactful partnerships with ind indigenous people, tribes, and their sovereign governments and intertribal organizations. Uh, now, uh, now I have a few housekeeping tips for everyone, and, the, and I'll uh, get out of the way so James can start his talk. Uh, just so you know, we are recording this session uh, and, and they will all be available on YouTube's, uh, sorry, Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District YouTube channel a week after the session. So look for links in the registration page. At the end of the presentation, we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, if you have questions, please put your questions into the Q&A section, not the chat. I will not really be monitoring the, I, I will be monitoring the Q&A, but not the chat. If you're in the Q the Q and A section and you see a question you like, you can upvote it by clicking the thumbs up icon in the Q and A window. Now, without further ado, I'm happy to introduce James Cassidy. He has been a senior instructor at uh, Oregon State University, teaching introductory soils science and sustainable and agri organic agriculture for over 15 years. He is also the founder and faculty advisor for the wildly popular OSU Organic Growers Club. OSU student farm now in its 21st season, coming up on a non-traditional, coming from a non-traditional background in the music industry. James is passionate about soils and I can attest to that. And it has been our opening presenter at Soil School since it began in 2012. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to James and let him take it for me. All right, hey, thanks, man, I really appreciate it. God, I can't believe I've gone to every one of these. I remember the first one. It was in a tiny little place. I think I threw something across the room and Teresa Madison looked at me like, what the? So anyway, I'm surprised I got invited back. Anyway, uh, thanks a lot uh, for having me. And um, I've been farming all day today. I didn't almost forget about it, but I did almost forget about this talk at one point. 
about 4.30 today. So, oh my God, what time is it? Anyway, so I've been putting in cauliflower and broccoli today and taking down high tunnel plastic and working with like tons of different students. And I run the student farm here on campus. And I've done that for, I've done that for 21 years. And I started that one as a grad student. And somehow I parlayed that into a career here at the university where I teach introductory soil science classes. And I also specialize in organic agriculture and soil management for organic production. And uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm actually teaching uh, this session today <clears throat> from my teaching lab. And I have this um, camera here that I can move around and I have some demos set up today because I want to show you some stuff. So really, you know, having to teach or getting to teach by Zoom, I've been able to do some things that I normally wouldn't be able to do, like hauling all this stuff around. And stack, I can just be here in my teaching lab. So thanks a lot for having me here today. And uh, I'm going to tell you all about soil. And I'm going to start um, just with an opening slide here. And this is uh, what the talk is. It's very, very simple. All I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about <clears throat> what soil is and how it works. And, you know, <clears throat> everything else, once you understand, it's kind of like cooking or something. You know, so, you know how you've like opened up the refrigerator and you just kind of take all the stuff out and you kind of know what you're doing. You throw together something and it's awesome. Or if you follow a recipe, you go out and you buy all this stuff, you spend all this money, and by the time you get it done, it's not very good. And, you know, really the way to cook is just to learn how to cook, right? And then whatever ingredients you have. And that's kind of my goal here tonight is to kind of teach you the basics of soil so that you can sort of figure out the rest of the stuff yourself and understand how it actually works and what it really is. And most people, you know, most people, of course, never think about soil. Um, they, ironically, they go to their graves, having never once considered the reality that soil is. And what I want you to understand is what, and you probably have a pretty good idea. I mean, you guys look at, there's like 85 people showing up here on a Tuesday night at 6 p.m. I mean, this is crazy. You guys are amazing. I mean, I can't believe this is like, you're my people. You know, this is the people that I want to talk to and I know you're super excited about and interested in soil, you're probably gardeners and you wanna know more about soil. And I'm gonna go about maybe like 45 minutes to an hour and then we'll have a little bit of time for some questions. And uh, so I wanna get going, all right? So what is soil? I mean, what soil is, soil is, is it's all about soil, number one. And I don't mean just like, gardening and trees and, and stuff like that. I mean, all of it is about soil. I mean, everything in this room, every person you've ever seen, everything you've ever eaten, everything you've ever touched, everything you've ever seen on a vacation, every mountain, all of that stuff, everything you've ever seen, it's all from the soil. It all comes from the soil. And maybe you don't realize this. Maybe you never thought about this, but every, every, atom in your body every atom in your body was has been through the soil system billions of times already the fact that you are not soil at this moment is a temporary condition and it won't be long now folks it's almost over and i don't mean this talk i mean your time on at this moment i mean here we are together a hundred people together 97 participants here tonight, via this incredible like information revolution opportunity to be together. And here we are in this moment in the history of the cosmos together in this tiny little frame of time in order to talk about the most important thing that there really is in human existence. This is what it's all about. I mean, all of it comes from this. I mean. Every atom in your body is once inside of a rock. I'll say that again. Every atom in your body was once inside of a rock. And rocks dissolve in water. Okay? I mean, most people never think about that, but they do. Because 
we don't live long enough to really get what's happening on the planet. And I happen to have some rocks here. Here's a rock. This is a piece of granite. And what a rock is, is cooled magma. And you can see these different colored crystals in it. Those different crystals are different elements. And those elements are in a crystalline form and they're not available to biological systems when they're in this form. But in here, look at this black crystals. Actually, let me switch cameras here really quick. I'll show you something. This is a, so a better image here. I'll zoom in on this, right? So here's, here's a rock. And what this is made out of are the elements in the Earth's crust. And there's like 118 elements, depending on how you count. And that's what everything is made out of. And that's what this rock is made out of. And every atom in your body was once inside of a rock. And then rocks dissolve in water. And then they're released in a form that can be taken up by plants. Here's a rock. Look at this rock. A different colored rock, right? Look at this rock. Different kinds of rocks. Here's a different kind of rock. Here's some sandstone, right? Here's some really sparkly stone of some sort, right? And each one of these is made up of different crystals and have different elements. And so the soils that form from these different rocks have different properties and different nutrients. And that's why there's different soils in different places. Now, I don't know if you know this, but there's over 20,000 thousand different named soils 20 000, just like plants and animals have different names and are different kinds that's called taxonomy we have the same thing for soil right but before we get to all that i do want to i do want to do a little demonstration here and look here is a rock and here's some water and i want you to watch because this rock is about to dissolve in water are you ready pay attention because here it comes, there's some water. See that? Look at that. Do you see that? Look closer. It's dissolving. And you probably are like, what? Come on. Is this like a joke? No, it's not a joke. It really is dissolving. Just a tiny, tiny little bit is dissolving right now. A little bit is dissolving out of that. And if you don't believe me that rocks dissolve in water, here's what you need to do. Look, here's some salt. And salt is a mineral. In fact, it's one of the only minerals that we actually just ingest as a mineral. All the other minerals have to dissolve first, be taken up by plants, and then we eat the plants, or we eat animals that ate the plants. But that's how we get it in us. But if you don't believe me that rocks dissolve in water, because my demonstration was too short of a time, but I'm telling you right now, if I put a drop on this for 10 years, 1,000 years, for 5,000 years, maybe 10,000 years, this thing would completely dissolve away. And check it out. So here's some salt. I'm going to put a little salt on my hand, my filthy, soily hand. And I'm just going to like lick it. And you should do that. Mm. And that is a, a mineral. Look, it just dissolved. It's gone. S salt is a mineral and it dissolves really fast. And then the next thing, and, that, and, the, and that's what's in here. So every time I put a little bit of this, and there's a little bit of salt that dissolves out of this rock. And that salt, if it was in nature, it would eventually end up in the soil. And that soil, that, that salt, that salt water would move down by gravity. And it would keep going down until it gets down to the water table. And once it gets to the water table, that water table is connected to the creek. And the creek flows into the little river, and the little river flows into the big river, and the big river flows into the giant river, the giant river flows into the ocean. And that's why the oceans are salty. Yeah? And the next thing to dissolve out of this rock is the potassium, or the phosphorus, or the silica, or molybdenum, or the cadmium, or the iron or the calcium and all the other things that are in this rock are eventually going to dissolve out. And where do they go? Down into the water table, which goes to the little river, which goes to the big river, which goes out of the ocean. And that's why there's sharks because the nutrients 
are coming out of the rocks and ending up in the ocean. And those nutrients float around in the ocean and some phytoplankton, right? They use the sunlight energy and they take the nutrients and they build their tiny little bodies. And then a, a larger one eats them and a zooplankton eats that thing. And a tiny little fish eats that and a bigger fish eats that and a bigger fish eats that and a bigger fish eats that and pretty soon it's a shark. And that's why there's life on the planet Earth is because does rocks dissolve in water and the oceans are where the life got the beginnings. And sooner or later, we brought the ocean with us, inside of us, in our blood. And that's why our salt, that's why our blood is salty, because we carry the ocean around inside of us. And the last thing to dissolve out of a rock is the quartz. So salts first, then everything else. And the last thing to dissolve out is quartz. And you can see that because I put a little bit of water on here. See, it doesn't dissolve at all, right? And that's what sand is on the beach. So if you want to see ancient mountain ranges that no longer exist, go to the ocean. Go to the ocean, reach down, take up some of that water, taste it and taste the salts, and then reach down and grab a handful of sand. And that are the skeletons of ancient mountain ranges. And what soil is, is somewhere between the two, somewhere between all the nutrients being held in a rock and complete dissolution into the ocean. Somewhere in between is soil. And that's what soil is. It's not in a rock anymore. And it's not out in the ocean. It's somewhere in between. And I happen to have some soil right here. Here's a chunk of soil. And this soil has some mineral nutrients in it. But this soil is half space. This thing is really heavy. It's not a lot of airspace. It can't hold any water. Bug, bugs can't live inside of rocks. Plants can't grow roots inside of rocks. They have to grow into the pore space. And soil, there's some soil right here, is about half space, man, okay? About half of this is space. And that space is either filled with air or it's filled with water, depending on the size of the pore. And that's where things, that's where the activity in soil is, is where the soil isn't, man. Where the soil isn't is this empty space. And that's where the bugs live. That's where the water is. That's where the air is. That's where the, that's where the, the roots are and the earthworms. They're in between the particles in the space. Now, maybe you don't know this. You maybe you don't want to know this. But here is that I'm in. In a single pinch of soil, I happen to have some soil right here. This is our state soil, by the way. It's called Jory, and it's really red. I don't know if you can see how red it is. But in a single pinch of soil, there are over one billion living organisms in that pinch of soil right now. Over one billion living organisms in a single pinch of soil. I dare you to, to, to forget that. I dare you to remember it. I dare you today, before the sun goes down, before your head hits the pillow tonight, to go out in a private moment, get down on your hands and knees and pick up a pinch of soil and just think about that. This um, one billion living organisms in a, in a pinch of soil, and not just this pinch of soil, Every pinch of soil you will ever see ever again in your life. This is where the life on the planet is. By any measure, soil is the most diverse habitat on the planet Earth. By any measure, by the mass of organisms, by the diversity of organisms, by just the sheer numbers of organisms. <clears throat> 10 times that of the most fertile seawater. Because in here are, look at, there's two habitats in here. Some of it's air-filled in those big pores. That's air-filled. And then look, when I put a little bit of water on it, it absorbs the water. See how it absorbs the water? And the large pores are drained and the big, and, and the small pores are holding water against the force of gravity. And that is a miracle. That's called capillary force. 
And soils store water against the force of gravity and they drain in the large pores. That's twice as many habitats as the ocean right there, okay? Water-filled habitats and air-filled habitats. And there's a billion right here, right now in this pinch of soil, there are over 1 billion living organisms. Okay, try to remember that, try to forget that. I dare you. What I challenge you to do is every day of the rest of your life to consider the reality that of what soil is. And that really you, I would argue, you are soil right now. You're made of exactly the same things that are in these rocks, that is in this soil. And sooner or later, man, every atom in your body is going back to the soil. And it won't be long now. 70, 80, 90 years. What's that? In geologic time? In a four billion, four and a half billion year old planet? What's 70, 80 years? You're not even here. You're just here. Look at you're mostly soil. And you're kind of, hey, this is pretty cool. Before you know it, it's over. And so for this moment, here we are together talking about this thing that is just so omnipresent that we never even really consider it, right? And there's 20,000 different types of soil. And there's probably one named after you for all you know. Check it out. I'm going to show you this. Come over here. Look at these. These are just some of the soils of Oregon, right? We've got Dayton and Amity, and look how deep, these are actually mounted specimens of soil. And you can see here's the surface, and as you go down, they look different as you go down. This is where the organic matter is, because this is where the stuff lives and dies, 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 and leaves behind black residues over tens of thousands of years. Pretty soon you've got these dark, horizons we call them up here this is a dark soil here lighter down here's actual rocks down in here and soils soils don't they don't build up they build down and they eat down the rocks are dissolving and the nutrients are moving and the accumulation of organic matter is at the surface because this is where the stuff lives and dies and so you end up with all this organic matter in here and now we've got to talk about organic matter because organic matter is the other side of the coin. The other side of the coin is organic matter. So we've talked about minerals dissolving, making sand, silt, and clay-sized particles, dissolving out nutrients and having pore space in there for where the bugs, the billions in a single pinch, and the earthworms and the roots and all that stuff can live, right? This is the habitat. These are the nutrient sources. But what is organic matter? Now, organic matter is a different thing. Organic matter, I happen to have some right here. Look at here's some here's some uh, some <laughs> very dead um, ferns, right? And what this is, what are ferns made out of? Yes, they're made out of out of dissolved minerals, but most of this is carbon. Mo we we are carbon based life forms, man. Okay. That's what we're made out of too. Carbon is the, is the type of life that we have on this planet. And where does the carbon come from? You might think, um, rocks? No, it doesn't come from the rocks. It comes from the atmosphere. And plants eat the atmosphere. They eat carbon dioxide. And then they build their tissues from the carbon, from carbon dioxide. All right? So most people think, oh, they take in carbon dioxide and they exhale CO2. No, they don't breathe it. They eat it. Plants eat the atmosphere. And so they take this carbon dioxide and they take it apart and they put it together into tissues. And in order for something to be taken apart and put together into something else requires energy input. And where does the energy come from that allows a plant to eat the atmosphere? Where does it come from? It comes from the sun, okay? 
The sun is shining down on us. And where is it? What is it? It's a star. And it's a nuclear reaction going on out there. And it's 93 million miles away. And it's giving UV radiation to this planet. Of 93 million miles away, the UV radiation is coming to the planet. And plants have figured out a way to take the UV radiation and use that energy to knock, to knock an, an electron into a higher orbital inside of the chloroplast. And when it drops down, it releases a little bit of energy. And that energy is captured in a, in a molecule called ATP. <laughs> and the energy is actually in there. And that can move around in the cell of the, of the plant. And when needed, it can be, that work can be like <laughs> released <laughs> and, and rip apart a, a CO2 molecule <laughs> and put it <laughs> into tissues, into wood, into leaves, right? And so the energy from the sun is in these carbon to carbon bonds. The energy from the sun at the time of photosynthesis is stored inside of these chemical bonds. And that's why we eat it. That's why we eat vegetables and plants is to get the energy from the sun. Think about it. Every beat of your heart right now, feel, feel for your pulse. And you can feel it. Every beat of your heart is energy from the sun that was captured by photosynthesis by plants that lived in soil. And every thought you've ever had was, is energy that was captured by plants that lived in soil from photosynthesis. And then you ate that and inside of you, look, there's a hole here and there's a hole back here, right? And there's a tube going through your body. That's the outside world that's inside of you. And inside of the outside world that's inside of you, you got that? Are the same bugs that are in soil. The soil is inside of you. From this end of the tube to that end of the tube is a tube that has bugs in it, the same bacteria and fungi, many of the same ones. And what are you doing? You're adding organic. Hey, you want to know what the answer is? Let's just pull back for a second. You want to know what the answer is? Doesn't matter what the question is. The answer is add organic matter. What's the, what's the answer? Say it out loud. Add organic matter. Turn to the nearest person next to you and say, add organic matter. Add organic. Why? Because what is organic matter? Organic matter is carbon from the atmosphere and energy from the sun. And when you add that to the soil in the form of plant debris, compost, manures, cover crops, all that stuff, what you're doing is you're, inje you're, you're, you're putting energy and carbon into the soil. And inside of this soil are bacteria. They don't even know there's a sun. They're just waiting for stuff to die. And then they eat that. Just like we eat stuff that dies, we eat that. And we get our carbon and energy from other organisms. But these are the primary producers. That's why you're so cool to be growing food in your garden, because now you're totally apart. You're, you're completely self-contained. You're doing the work of an earthling when you're growing your own food and eating your own food and gathering energy from the sun, carbon from the atmosphere. And I'm going to do a quick demo here just to prove to you. Here's an, a test of mine. And I'm just gonna take a piece of paper from this test. And what is paper made out of? It's made out of wood, right? This was once a tree. And this is carbon from the atmosphere and energy from the sun is contained inside of this. And if I get this hot enough and overcome the activation energy necessary for the oxidation reaction called burning to happen, it produces its own heat from the energy from the sun that's contained in the carbon to carbon bonds that were captured there during photosynthesis when this plant was a tree living in the soil. And so now I happen to have a match right here. And here's a piece of wood. This is a Brazilian match, okay? It's from Brazil. And if I get this match, this piece of wood, 451 degrees, 
by creating frictional heat because I'm using my muscles, which are energy from the sun, to create that frictional heat, it bursts into flames. And now, it's that is the energy of the sun that's in there right now. And I can use that to overcome the activation energy necessary to start this chain reaction. And now, I'm, I, got a, I got a trash fire here in the basement of ALS at the Oregon State University, don't tell anybody that I'm having a little bit of fun here with you, but I'm gonna capture that right there. And look, it's burning up. And look, at it's going away. Have you noticed how it shrunk? And it's gonna completely go away. Now it's like a little bit of smoke. And now the fire is out because all of the energy that was, cons that was in those carbon to carbon bonds has been released as heat. So it comes in as UV radiation, is captured in the carbon to carbon bonds, and when it burns, it's released as heat. And what happened to the paper? Where did the paper go? Where did it go? It's mostly gone away, and mostly it went back to CO2, back to CO2, where it came from. So it goes back to CO2, water vapor, and heat, and look what's left over. What's left over? Look at this stuff. Look at this stuff. What is this stuff? Look at it. What is that stuff? That's ash. And what is ash? Ash is the minerals that were taken up when a rock dissolved and this plant took up those minerals. And there's not very much minerals. Look, when it's all said and done, there's just a little bit of pile of ash. And think about it, when you burn a fire, like you go out in the backyard and you start a little fire, you can put wood in there all night long and it goes away. Where's it going to? CO2, water vapor, and heat. And what's left over? Ash. And that's what, and that's what happens in a compost pile. Ever notice how a compost pile gets smaller? Why? It's going back to CO2, water vapor. You can see the steam and the heat you can feel. Where does the heat come from? From the energy that's stored in the carbon to carbon bonds from the plant. When it was photosynthesized, it captured energy from the sun when it lived in the soil. And then it goes away. What's left over? A little concentrated ash. And what is ash? Nutrients. And that's why you add it to your garden soil because it's kind of cooked down and it still has a higher concentration of ash nutrients in it, and it stores water, and it does all these, things, and it's food for soil the billions in a single pinch. And what do they need? They need the same thing you do, organic matter. What's the answer? Add organic matter, okay? Now, you should get a soil test, and you can do that. And you know what? When you've got four or 5% organic matter in your soil, and that's from a soil test, not just eyeballing it, but actually send it in 30, 40 bucks, right? And if you have four or 5% organic matter, you did it. If, you're, if, you're, if your organic matter is starting to drop from year to year, you need to add organic matter. And the easiest way to add organic matter is to grow it. Grow it as a plant, right? And the, the next easiest way is to buy some compost. But when you get to four or 5% organic matter, that's enough. And I'd love to tell you more about that, but I gotta get to these slides. My God, we're more than half over. So I'm gonna get to this. Here it is, where is it? So, so oh, it's all about soil, right? I mean, this is what it's all about. And we just don't get it because we're so immersed in it that we never think about it. Check it out. Here's, here's some soil, I don't know if you know this, but there's 12 different soil orders. So I said there's 20,000 different name soils. They all belong to one of the 12 soil orders. And here are two of them, very contrasting ones. Here's one called an aridosol. What do you think that means, aridosol? It's a dry soil, right? And does, do rocks dissolve in air? No, they don't. They only, they dissolve in water and there's not very much water here. In fact, it only rains about six inches here. Look at, they're looking at a profile view, meaning if you cut a hole, and then stood there and looked at the wall in profile. This is what this soil would look like, going from the surface on down. And right here is about 12 inches of soil, which is about 50% porosity. So if it rains six inches here on average, that means because this is occupied 50% by stuff, 
it's going to go down to about 12 inches, the water is. And then it stops raining. And you know what happens? What's the first thing that dissolves out of a rock? The salt. And what does the salt do? It goes down to about 12 inches, and then it stops raining. And then it precipitates out. And that happens over and over and over and over again. And in an arid environment, you end up with a salt horizon. This is a BK horizon. It's called a, it's a, it's a salt calcic horizon. And so all of the other nutrients are much slower to dissolve than salt. And so there's not a lot of nutrients being released in this system because there's not a lot of water. And if you want to live there, you got to look like this. That's it. This is the best you can be. And those things are actually perfectly adapted. Those sage plants or whatever they are, are perfectly adapted to living in salty soils without very much water and not a lot of nutrients. And that's what a native plant is. It's a plant that has adapted to the soil conditions. And the soil is formed by the climate, by the plants and animals that live there, by the steepness or flatness of, of the terrain, and what kind of rock is dissolving in the first place. Because this rock produces a different soil than that rock, which produces a different soil than that rock. And that's what this one's doing. Over here on the right-hand side are called mollusols. And mollusols are these, this is in feet here. So two feet thick of this very dark organic matter rich soil. And there's a lot of carbon and energy in there. And there's a lot of biological activity in there. And the more biological activity there is, the more processing of carbon, energy, and nutrients there are, the more release of the nutrients there are, the more the plants can grow there. And more plants that grow there mean more plants die there, which leave behind organic matter, which is carbon, energy, and nutrients. And that's what soil building is. And this is called a mollusol. And this is the most important, bio, uh, important agricultural soil that we have on the planet. It is called a mollusol, mollify. To mollify something is to soften it. Your molars, they soften, right? And so this is a soft chocolate cake kind of soil, right? And this is mostly, this organic matter, is from roots. Think about it. Roots grow down into the soil. What are they made out of? Carbon and energy and nutrients. And then they die. And then they biodegrade. And then they inject and every year more roots, death, more roots, dying, living and dying, living and dying, living and dying. And pretty soon you have this giant thick, what's called an A horizon. And this one, you can't even see an A horizon. And that's because of the water mostly, but also the type of rock and et cetera. So um, here's other soils, right? Here's the amazing thing is there's one called an inceptisol. Look at this one. Looks like it's got some black stuff in there, right? But look at these rocks. Before you farm this, you'd have to dig all these rocks out. And once you dig all those rocks out, there's not much left, right? So the soil volume is actually pretty small in an inceptisol. And look at this, between the iridosols and the inceptosols, that's like 30% of the Earth's ice-free surface is this kinds of soil, these kinds of soil. Not really suitable for agriculture. In fact, here's a global soil regions right here. And here's where the mollusols are. We have 21% of the North American landmass in the United States is mollusols. Worldwide, it's 7%. And that's really all you need to know about why we live this privileged life, because we have the good soils. And they who have the good soils have the power, the literal power. What this really is a map of is a map of political power. And this is Russia over here, and that's what the Cold War was all about, is they who have the good agriculture have the advanced technologies and can build thermonuclear devices, and they control the planet for good or for evil, right? I mean, this land was taken from other people, as we learned as we thanked earlier in this presentation. And this is why this land is so incredibly rich. But continuing on, because I want to look at, here's oxisols in the tropics. You might think that the tropics has really good soils, but really it's so wet and so humid there that most of the nutrients have washed out of the soils and have gone into the ocean and become sharks. And it's really in these mid-latitudes where we have just enough water that the soil is mobilized, that the nutrients are mobilized, that plants grow, but it's cold enough in this, in the, at certain times of the year that that stuff doesn't biodegrade and rot away very fast. 
and it hangs around as organic matter in the soil. And that's partly what a mollusol is, right? And in Oregon, we have 10 of the 12 soil orders. And we don't have oxisols, which are tropical soils, and we don't have gelosols, which are these frozen soils up here in the very high latitudes. These are frozen soils. Love to tell you more about that, but I wanna keep going because I got, we got stuff to talk about. And here's what I wanna talk about. Soil, soil doesn't come in a bag, okay? Soil forms over time from rotted rocks and accumulations of organic matter. And it's mostly space, right? And it's in space. So you're not really gardening. You're ranching microbes. And you're not really ranching microbes. You're actually managing space. And what you wanna do in your soil management is you wanna end up with large pores, medium pores, small pores, tiny pores, and super tiny pores. Because large pores drain under the force of gravity and small pores hold water under the force of gravity. And you know what? Plants, they breathe at their roots. So they need to breathe oxygen at their roots and they need water at their roots. They need both. So look at this. Small pores hold water against the force of gravity and large pores drain under the force of gravity. And that's why you want a well-structured soil. Soil, nothing, if you get nothing else out of this talk, soil is habitat. And if you can internalize that, you know what to do to it and what not to do to it. A single pinch contains over a billion living organisms. And check it out, it's not just one organism, tens of thousands of different organisms are in a single pinch of soil. In a single pinch of soil, there are tens of thousands of different organisms in there. And look at this, just in this little clump of soil, here it is, a half a millimeter by a half a millimeter. Here's pieces of sand here. And look at, they're interacting with this water that's being held here in the small pore. And they're dissolving into it and releasing nutrients. And then there's a giant sea serpent. And that giant sea serpent is eating these things, which drink the poop of that thing, which eats this thing's pee. And that's a giant, that's an entire ecosystem between three pieces of sand. That's why the diversity of soil organisms is so high is because the habitat is so diverse. And that is job number one on the planet Earth for humans is to provide diverse habitat for soil organisms. And that means minimizing disturbance. Look at this big space right here. That was an old root. A root grew into there, got bigger, filled up, pushed these sand particles away, and then it died and it completely went back to CO2, water, vapor, and heat. And it left behind this big pore, which drains and brings oxygen into the system. And this water is more oxygenated. And so therefore this, this ecosystem is more highly functional. Soil is a living thing, not a chemical sponge, okay? And I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip over the functions of soil. We're gonna review real quick. Soil is rotted rock and decomposed organic matter. And what are rocks? Well, look at it, here it is again, check it out. There's minerals, organic matter, space that's sometimes full of water and air, right? That's what soil is made out of. It has to have these four things or it really isn't soil or you could argue that it is at the bar with other Oregon Society of Soil Scientists if you want to. Join the Oregon Society of Soil Scientists. We have these fantastic meetings and we hang out and we argue about things like that and it's really fun. The Oregon Society of Soil Scientists. Won't you join, please? Thank you. But check it out. About 45% of soil of this thing is minerals. And there are different size minerals, sand, silt, and clay size minerals. Okay, so here's a rock. Rocks dissolve in water. First, the black stuff dissolves out, then the red stuff, and finally the quartz does. But eventually it all dissolves and it falls into different size particles, sand particles, silt particles and tiny little pieces of clay. So sand is anything from two millimeters down to 0 0.05 millimeters. It's just a rock though. Rocks are, they dissolve and they turn into sand sized particles. Then silt is a smaller rock. And this is a rock that has dissolved down and, run, and ground down to the size of a piece of silt. 0 0.05 millimeters to 0 0.002 millimeters. And then there's clay. See this tiny little speck here? That tiny little speck is 50 times too big 
because the large, the smallest pixel in the screen is 50 times too big relative to these other sizes of sand and silt. Would that we were the size of a piece of sand. And so clay is this tiny, tiny particle and, and clay is a different thing. So sand is just a rock, silt is a smaller rock, clay is a different thing. It's a secondary mineral. It forms when rocks dissolve in water and then recrystallizes at normal surface pressures and normal surface temperatures. Clay is a chemical compound that is made after rocks dissolve in the water and recrystallizes at normal surface temperatures and normal surface pressures. Rocks are actually very stable under the ground at high heat and high pressure. You bring them up to the surface and they dissolve and they fall apart and then they recrystallize into secondary minerals called clay. And those particles can only get to 0 0.002 millimeters. They can only, those structures can only get, they're crystals. Think of a crystal growing on a plane. It can only get to 0 0.002 millimeters before it breaks in half. It can grow, it's a crystal growing, gets to 0 0.002 millimeters, and then it breaks in half. And that's why clay is a special size, 0 0.002 millimeters or smaller. And it has special properties. And if it wasn't for clay, you wouldn't be here. Macroorganisms as we know it would not exist were it not for the fact that rocks dissolve in water and at the surface of the earth, they form clay-sized minerals, secondary minerals. And they're really special minerals, right? Clay is a secondary mineral that's formed at normal surface temperatures and normal surface pressures. And it is the product of dissolution and recrystallization. And now we're gonna go to school. Are you ready? Are you ready? Wake up, because we're going in deep here. Let's, re let's review real quick. Rocks dissolve in water. And when they dissolve in water, they release, look at silica, iron, aluminum, magnesium, potassium, nutrients are released. Some of these silica, iron, aluminum, and silica form secondary minerals and recrystallize into sheets of silica and aluminum oxide. So clay is an oxide, kind of like rust is an oxide. It's a secondary mineral. And they only form these particles that can only get to 0 0.002 millimeters. And they have multiple layers in them. So like, like if this was a piece of silt, if we, if we dissolved it and recrystallized it, and this would be like clay, it has multiple layers. Think about the surface area of a book compared to a brick. And that's what these sheets of aluminum and silica oxide are like. And now we're going in deep. This is what's dissolving out of a rock is silica tetrahedrons and aluminum octahedrons. Sorry, time to wake up because now it's going to be school, okay? And when silica uh, dissolves out of a rock, it forms a, really, it forms a bond with oxygen to make a silica tetrahedron. And aluminum forms a bond with these six oxygens, hydroxyls in this group, that form an aluminum octahedron. And then these things hook together into silica tetrahedral sheets and aluminum octahedral sheets. And this is the crystal that is formed when rocks dissolve and recrystallize at normal surface temperatures and normal surface pressures. And this is called the layer. And there's another one under there and another and another and another and another and another. And, and they just stack up on top of each other. And they stack up until they get about to 0 0.002 millimeters and then they fall over. And, this, and the plane of this can grow until it gets to about 0 0.02 millimeters and then it breaks apart. And that is the size of a clay crystal. So we're going in deep now. And this is, pay attention, because this is the reason you are alive. This is the reason you can garden and farm. This is the reason that there is agriculture and therefore you could become a specialist and become whatever you want to be because someone invented agriculture because agriculture is the concentration of biological growth in soil capturing energy from the sun and carbon from the atmosphere. You know what I'm saying? My goal here tonight is to change the way you see reality. Okay? And now we're going into, into the clay crystal and we're going to understand how it works. Okay? So we're moving in. So check it out. Here, there, as it turns out, there are other things that are dissolving out of the rock other than silica and other than aluminum, things like iron and magnesium. And when that crystal is forming, 
a substitution of those different elements can occur inside of the crystal and lattice work of clay. Hang on. There's a reason for this, okay? And when that happens, when instead of silica in the tetrahedral sheet, we get a little bit of iron substituted in at the time of recrystallization, we end up with a negative charge on the surfaces. Sand doesn't have a negative charge. Silt does not have a negative charge. Clay has a negative charge due to isomorphic substitution on the secondary mineral called clay. Look, the same thing happens in the octahedral sheet with magnesium. So if you have rocks that have more magnesium in them than iron, you end up with clays that have more isomorphic substitution and therefore more net negative charge. Now think about this. Rocks don't have negative charges on them. Clay does when it has isomorphic substitution on it. And you know what sticks to negatively charged things? Positively charged things. And you want to know what the charge of most mineral nutrients are that you get from fertilizer? Most of those are positively charged things. And so the positively charged things stick to the negative exchange complexes on clay. And, that's, that, and, and that prevents those nutrients from washing away into the groundwater, into the river, out into the ocean, and becoming sharks. So this thing called clay stores nutrients on it. And it's only temporarily hydrostatically stuck there. And that is the reason we can grow macroorganisms, that plants can grow. That's why humans are here, because nutrients are stored in soil. And you can measure the number of charges when you get a soil test. And it's called the cation exchange capacity. And the number of negative charges on the soil is the dollar value of the soil because the more negative charges are on that soil, the more nutrients it can store, the more energy from the sun it can capture, the more carbon from the atmosphere it can capture, the more organic matter can be produced, and the more carbon-based life forms can be exchanged for services and for for, for specialization. Yeah, see what I'm saying? At this scale, that's why it works is because of isomorphic substitution and the secondary mineral called clay. Look at, check it out. Here's what, here's what clay looks like at 100,000 times magnification. You can see it's not just a ground down piece of rock. It was built up atom by atom by silica tetrahedron, by aluminum octahedron. And that you can see they can stack up. They can only get to about 0 0.002 millimeters across. And they can only stack up about 0 0.002 millimeters before they fall over and break. And they have net negative charges all over them. Right? All over those surfaces. Those, it's got a giant surface area. A thimble full of sand has a surface area of about a sheet of paper. A thimble full of silt has the, the, the surface area, were you to lay all the surfaces out on the particles, of about a, a square yard, like a large um, sheet of paper. All right, I got five minutes. I got it. And, and, and a, a thimble full of, of clay has a football field's worth of surface area that has net negative charges all over due to isomorphic substitution. Look at this clay. Net negative charges on it due to isomorphic substitution. Second mineral called clay. Look at, look at that clay. It looks like fiber and has net negative charges all over those surfaces due to the isomorphic substitution on the secondary mineral called clay. Look at this clay. Net negative charges. Look at these clays. Net negative charges. Look at this clay. Net negative charges due to isomorphic substitution. The second mineral called clay is the reason for the season. It's the reason you're alive. Right? So let's all say it together. Net negative charge due to isomorphic substitution on the secondary mineral called clay is how soil stores nutrients. And because it can store nutrients, it can accumulate enough nutrients to make you. Otherwise, it'd all be in the ocean and just be sharks, right? Look at, there's clay. Look at clay. Look at calcium stuck there. Look at potassium is stuck there. Look, magnesium. These are nutrients that are stuck there from fertilizers. And you put this on in the ratios that you want to grow the crops that you want. And that's how soil works. Turns out there's this other thing called organic matter, which we've talked about already. And it's a very small part of what soil is. And, and what organic matter is, it looks like this. And it has net negative charges all over it. So organic matter itself is a small particle with charges all over it that can store positively charged nutrients. So the more organic matters in the soil, 
the more nutrients can be stored, the more plants that can grow there, the more carbon from the atmosphere, the more energy from the sun can be accumulated, and the more organic matter goes into the soil. And that's what soil building is. But it starts with clay, and then more and more. And that's what an ahorize, that's what a mollusol is, that's what a garden soil is. It can store nutrients, right? So I want to do a quick demo um, to, to demonstrate that to you. And I've actually not done this um, for, uh, for a talk yet. So I'm very kind of excited about it. So I'm going to take us to the super cam here. And we're going to go over to this little demonstration right here. Look in here, I have a little bit of soil, a, lo a loamy soil. And in here, I have some sand. And here is some blue dye. And this blue dye is negatively charged. I mean, sorry, this blue dye is a positively charged dye particle. So it's like a nutrient. And if I pour that into the sandy soil, you can see what comes in, what goes in is what goes out, right? Nutrients go in and then nutrients flow out. If I pour this positively charged dye, which is standing in for a nutrient, into a, into a nice loam that has some clay in it. Of course, it drains a little bit slower because it's a smaller particle, but watch what comes out the bottom. Hold on, just hold your horses. You'll see, it's a perfect little brown drop at first, but ultimately it's clear because it's storing the nutrients, it's storing the, the blue dye. And so the blue dye is a positively charged dye that you could think of as a nutrient and it's being stored there. Here, I'm gonna get rid of this dirty water and you can see that it's clear water coming out. And that's because the, the clay has a negative charge on it due to isomorphic substitution on the secondary mineral called clay. And if we just go over to the right just a little bit, you can see here are some plants growing in soil. Yeah, start seeing soil. And I've got some lights over here and I'm growing these for my class right now. And there it is. You can see there are roots punching down into the soil deep and they're leaving, that's carbon and energy. And eventually this plant is gonna die and those roots are gonna be left there and that's gonna be feeding the soil. And that's how soil works, you know? That's how it works. And real briefly, I'm gonna show this to you. Here's a, a final slide. Look, here's the root. Here is the tiniest root hair you never saw. Here is the final, the tiny root hair right here. What, so here's the, look, here's soil with a negative charge on it. Look what's stuck to it, nutrients. Plants breathe at their roots, they exhale CO2, which dissolves in water and forms hydrogen ion, which is carbonic, uh, carbonic acid, and this, these hydrogen ions are more strongly absorbed to the negative exchange complex than are the nutrients. And when there's enough CO2 in the water being exhaled from the root, it actually removes the nutrient from the, from the soil, which then flows into the plant. And that's how the calcium got into the plant. And that's how the calcium got into your body to become the bones of your body because you ate that calcium in that plant that was stored on that negative exchange complex. And sooner or later, folks, every calcium ion in your body, the skeleton that's inside of you, sooner or later, is going to be back on the negative exchange complex of clay and organic matter. And that is a fact. And it won't be long now, folks. And this talk actually is over now. And I'd be happy to take, your talk, take uh, some of your questions. Well, I misspoke a little bit. Technically, we had till 7.30, according to our registration. What? But, but uh, okay. my bad. Well, I got um, stuff to show. What's that? I do have some cool things to show now. I mean, maybe you could show those off, and then we can launch and have a little bit of extra time for questions. Maybe oh, yeah. Okay. Let, me, let me show you something. This is a perfect time, because I kind of gave you the whole, like, here's what soil is. Here's how it works. Get used to it, okay? So... I wanna show you some really cool tools that you can use. Yes, this is for you. For you to know what kind of soil you have. So Scott, I'm gonna ask you to give me some information in a second here, because um, we're gonna use you. And I'm gonna show you this tool 
Um, it's called, check this out. This is the California Soil Resource Lab. And you just Google that, okay? Write this down, everybody. The California Soil Resource Laboratory. And you go to soil, this is home. This is what it looks like on the homepage. And you go to soil web apps. And there's an app for your phone, number one, that's free that you can download right now. It's called Soil Web. And you go to the app store and you type in Soil Web and you hit download. And if you can remember your, you know, your, your Apple ID, which I can't, um, you can download that app. And on your phone, wherever you're standing in the United States, you can push a button and you can find out what the soil is underneath of your feet. And I'm doing that right now. And it's gonna just take a few seconds, relax, because you know it's actually pulling the data from, um, from the, the bank. And there it is, check it out. There's under this building where I'm standing right now is wood burn soil and amity. And you can see it's got an A horizon, a thick, and look at the difference in color as you go down, right? And that's what this app does too. It's called Soil Web Earth, and you click on it, and it uploads. See this little program down here called Soil Web 13 KMZ? It, it uploads that, and then you click on that, and it, it puts it into your um, into Google Earth. Check it out. So here it is. So now you can see it right over here. It says Soil, soil Web right here, right? So now, just like Google Earth for other purposes, I can put in an address. And I'm going to put in Scott's address so we can all send him a pizza. But we're all going to pay for it, right? So what's your address, Scott? Or you could do the office if you want to. I don't know. But you got to take your mute off. You got to take it. Look at that, man. Okay, let's find out. Let's see. I already have the app, so I could just show it to you. There it is. Well, I'll, I'll put in my address. What the hell? Actually, I'll, I'll, put, in, I'll, I'll put in Corvallis. There you go. Corvallis, Oregon. That way you can send a pizza to all of us down here. So look, I'm going to go there. Look, this is worth the price of admission right here, especially considering there was no price of admission tonight. There's Corvallis. And look, here's the student farm is over here, right over there's the student farm. And watch what happens any second now. We're going to get the soils are going to show up here. And there they are. Look at that. Look at that. You see these lines? This is a soil type called, it, that is the number 18, here's 21. Each one of these is a different soil type. And you can just find out, you can put in your address and find out, and here's where the student farm is. Let's go down to it. There it is, that mess right there that those darn kids keep meddling with and, and causing all sorts of weed problems and teaching themselves about organic agriculture, which they've done for 21 years. Thank you very much. All volunteer, including me, 21 years, okay? And, and if I click on that, look, it's a Chehalis silty clay loam. That's one of 20,000 different soils. And if I click on the anything that's blue, it takes me to a description of Chehalis. And here it is. Look, it's got a thick A horizon because it, look, it ends in all. It's a mollusol. In fact, it's a fine, silty, mixed, mesic, cumulic, ultic, haplazir all, which is also known as Chehalis. And if we go down, we look at this, right? It's got deeper horizons. Here's the exciting thing about this app. Check it out. These are the native or naturalized plants that are associated with this soil. And why are these, why are these plants in that soil? Because they're adapted to the water holding capacity, the nutrient supply capacity, the temperature, right? The flooding frequency, all that stuff. And look what's there. Vine, maple, wild ginger, cascade, Oregon grape, our state, that's our state plant. Right? Or is there a state fruit? I think it's a state plant. Anyway, and so those are the native plants that are so associated with this native soil. And look at here's the forest productivity. And any one of these, we could click on these and learn about these plants as well. But here's the amazing thing. Look at these. So here is the percent organic matter. And it, it's 8% at the surface. And then as you go down in the soil, at deeper into the soil, you can see that drops off to 3% at about 38 centimeters. And why is there more organic matter in the top 38 centimeters? Because that's where the things live and die, 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 right? And that's what an A horizon is. And look here, here's the percent clay. It's 35% clay 
down to about 38 centimeters. And then that drops off to 30%. And why is that? Because this is probably flooded. This soil came in on a flood and about 38 centimeters up was the most recent flood. And that was probably like 3000 years ago or something for all we know. Look at the percent sand, really low, 6% sand. Here's the rate at which water flows into the soil, 32 millimeters per hour. That's the infiltration capacity. Look at the pH. The pH is pretty good. That's why the student farm is there because it has a really nice amount of clay. It has good infiltration. It has a lot of organic matter and it has a neutral pH. And that's why there's a student farm. It's not because of me, man. It's because of the soil and me just showing up every Thursday night from 4.30 to dark for the last 21 years. For me just showing up every Sunday morning from nine to noon for the, la nine to noon for the last uh, 20 years. But it's because of the soil. And look at these. These are salts, different salts. And why is there zero salt in this soil? Where is the salt? Where did it go? It washed away and went into the ground table, into the groundwater, which went into the Willamette River, which went into the Columbia River, which went into the ocean, which is why the oceans are salty, because it rains enough here that there's no salt accumulations. And here's the CEC the cation exchange capacity, the number of negative charges on the soil. And if you, let me, and you might be wondering, 30, 30 what? And what that is, is 30 times 6 trillion trillion negative charges per kilometer or per, per um, kilogram of dry soil. And a kilogram of dry soil is about the size of a softball. And in this, in a kilogram of, of, of Chehalis soil at the surface, there are 30 times 6 trillion trillion negative charges on it. That means it can store 60, I'm sorry, 30 times 6 trillion trillion positively charged nutrients, which is a high number, which is why this is valuable class one farmland. And if you wanted to buy it, it doesn't matter what kind of a house is on it. It doesn't matter what the view is. This is prime farmland. And it costs a lot of money because you know why? Because it can capture more energy from the sun, more carbon from the atmosphere and make more organic matter, which is the value, right? That's what food is and everything else flows from that. And this is the linear extensibility, which tells us about the shrink swell capacity of the kind of clay. And the better clays have a higher shrinking and swelling capacity because they have more isomorphic substitution. Of course, there's different kinds of clays, and I'm not going to tell you all of that. Everything I can't tell you everything. I I have said about 100 million, 100,000 words in the past 60 minutes here, probably. Let's go back. Let's. Why don't we go to Bend, Oregon, really quick, and we'll see what the soils are like on the other side of the mountain. So we fly over here. We've got our California Soil Resource Laboratory. Um, uh, soil web app in here. Here's a look at Ben just goes on and on and on here. And let's see what kinds of soils are out here on Pelican Drive. And we click on that. And what do we have? A desk camp loamy sand. So this is a sand that has a little bit of loam in it. And does sand have negative charges on it? No. Okay. And do you think, why is, why is there so little clay here? because there's not a lot of water there. So the rocks haven't dissolved. So they haven't released the nutrients. So the clays haven't formed. So the organic matter can't be accumulated. And that's why it's this kind of soil. Let's look at it. Let's look at desk amp. It's a mollusol, interestingly. And it, you know, for Ben, that's pretty thick soil, okay? And it's a pretty decent soil. Look, it has a pH of seven. But look, it's 81% sand. Look, it's 2% clay. Do you think the CEC is high? Look at 1.5% organic matter and 2% clay. Do you think the CEC is pretty low? Yeah, it is. It's 7.5 times 6 trillion trillion negative charges per kilogram of dry soil. That's like five times less, right? Or so, six times less than the, where the student farm is. It'd be a lot harder to have a student farm here, let alone out here. Let's see what it's out here by Walker Road. Now we're talking about 
juniper, the name of this soil is juniper lobs, lava blisters. Okay, that doesn't sound like a really great place to be a plant or, or something. Oh, that's, I guess it's a place. I don't even know what that is. The pumice flats. They don't even call them soils here. Who knows? Okay, there they are. Types of soil. Okay, so that's a tool that you need to use. You need to get that app right now. I'll wait while you do it. Does anybody have a question about that? About how to get that? We have several other questions. But, Let's do uh, it. I got slides yeah, forever. One thing we could do is uh, maybe on our uh, website for the for this uh, whole program that we can share that link for folks. I'll, uh, why don't I put it in the chat? And that would be right good too. now because I'm a thoroughly modern man. For those, oh, for those, I'm ancient. For those who are super curious about the soil at my house, I have a Clackamas soil. I'm in Clackamas, Clackamas? County. You'd probably be shocked by that, which is a typical agro aqua all. Oh, so it's a mollusol. The mollusol. Uh, sorry, my webcam's not good enough to get a good. Uh, right. Good, uh, well, actually, here's a, here's an exciting thing we can do, Scott. Just for a moment before we get to those questions, is I can we can look up the name of that soil just by going to a website, right? I and mean, all we gotta do is just Google it, right? We'll just Google yeah. that shit. So uh, what is it? Clackamas, C-L-A-C-K? C-L-A-C. A. C-L-A-C. Sorry. Not C-A-L. Clack. C-L-A-C-A-M-A-S. Clackamas soil. Really, I can spell when I'm not on the district, okay. Uh, there's the soil water concentration district, but I'm gonna say soil series. All right, get rid of all that. Let's see. And there it is, the official series description for Clackamas series. And let's look at that. Here it is. Look, it's a um, on Willamette, it's a fine loamy mix, superactive music, typical RG aqua. Well, RG means clay. So it's a mollusol that has some clay and it's aqua, meaning wet. It's a typical one, has a mesic soil temperature regime. It has superactive clay, so it probably has a pretty high CEC. It's from mixed sources and it's a fine loam. So it's a silty soil that probably has a pretty good amount of clay in it. But it's considered a clackamous gravelly loam under grass. So it's got some gravel in it. And I can attest to that. There's a right. lot of rocks and gravel. In my so mind. gravelly loam at the surface, gravelly loam as you go down, gravelly clay loam as you go further down, extremely gravelly clay loam as you get down to 61 centimeters. So it's not the greatest. I, uh, having dug a few uh, fence posts, I can tell you it's extremely yeah. gravelly as you go down. So I'm telling you folks, <laughs> You, if you're ever going to buy a piece of property, I, I, by the way, I put that soil, uh, the California Soil Resource Lab in the chat uh, for all panelists and attendees. So copy that and paste it. But I'm telling you, if you're ever going to buy land again, first thing you do is get out your app and like say, well, what's the soil like here? And if it's really nice soil, don't say anything. And if it's really crappy soil, you can start to bargain. But these days, people don't care about soil. You think people care about soil? You think anybody's thinking about soil except 80 people right now <laughs> in Clackamas County? Probably not. Ironically, I mean, talk about, come on. It's all about soil, and yet nobody's talking about it. And that is what we need in our leadership. We need our leadership to understand what soil is and how it works. And it is the source of all political power. Our politicians don't even know where the power comes from. It comes from the sun, man. We got any questions? We got some questions. I will say just uh, full disclosure, I, I was a graduate student in James's class many years ago. And when I was just looking for a house, I had my soiled app out. No way. Touring homes just to double check what was going on there, but we obviously didn't pick the greatest soil to grow our gardens on. But well, you can't afford it. Uh, exactly. Yes. Yep. Uh, but actually, the first question. Do you want me to just read you some questions and you yeah, just yeah. do it? So the first question we got actually kind of is a good question, a segue from what I was just talking about, and they're asking what the perfect uh, raised bed soil for growing vegetables would be. Well, you know, first of all, determine whether you actually need a raised bed. 
Some people will not garden unless they have a raised bed because they think their soil is bad. Most people think their soil is bad. First thing I would do is find out if your soil is good. If you live in the Willamette Valley, man, you probably have really good soil and better soil than you could ever buy at the garden center, okay? But maybe you have thin soil. Maybe you have gravelly, extremely gravelly, cobbly loam. So what you want to get is the best soil that money can buy, okay? That's what you want. And you don't want to cheap out on the soil because it may seem like a lot of money, um, but I'm telling you, you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to make it produce. So do yourself a favor, get the good stuff. It should be a, a nice sandy loam or a silt, silty loam. And they sell this stuff manufactured from, you know, they blend it and stuff. But you know what? Get equal parts of soil and compost and buy the best compost money can buy. These days up in Portland, I just heard this today, you can buy compost that's $80 a yard. But for a little garden, a yard is a lot. And who cares? You're all rich. I mean, come on. Just buy the good stuff. You know, somebody's making the good stuff. Reward them with your dollars, okay? And you can't really get it. <laughs> there isn't a, a, a really isn't an international market for it. So most compost and soils are local anyway. So find out these guys, Scott, and those they, sh they should know who sells the good stuff. Who sells the good stuff? Is anyone? I, I can't, as a government employee, I can't. Uh, okay, <laughs> but, okay. But if you look for uh, farm stores, there are uh, urban farm stores in Portland. Right. Uh, as, long as, as well as other places that source great soils up here. Uh, we just got to uh, two yards of it to fill our garden beds because we have such gravelly soil. Uh, we decided we did need garden beds. And I, I will say one other uh, component that we talk to folks about garden beds is if you have an older home, especially built before the early 70s, yep. plants have led uh, near the home. So the closer your garden bed is to your home, the more you might want to consider, especially if you're going to grow root vegetables uh, or anything that grows actually in the soil, you may want to consider raised beds in those situations. But um, the, next, the next question, and this is a bit of a longer one, you might want to follow along um, if you have the option, James, but it actually kind of gets a little bit out of all this. So this person uh, applied a bunch of stuff to their soil and had some issues with it. So I'll just read it to you and you can kind of give us all your right. So last winter, they applied uh, approximately two inches of stuff, quote unquote, from my chicken coop to my raised beds. Okay, the stuff sounds about, good. The, well, the stuff was about 90% pine shavings. Mm, not good. Four month old chicken poop. I added one application of fish emulsion in case the poop hadn't completely uh, composted. The mixture was applied to a lovely cover crop of red clover. Skip forward to May, July, uh, I planted tomatoes, basil, thyme, etc. Nothing grew or bore fruit or even survived. Yep. Since then I've added five, 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 five dung uh, uh, and then dug everything in and allowed the whole mess to quote, rest. I planted another cover crop which germinated but it failed to grow. What happened? Uh, was it the pine shavings? Was it uh... probably the pines? I'll, I'll tell you one thing: when you're adding stuff to the soil, and it, it is worse, adding more stuff to the soil might be not the good thing to do. So you might want to stop adding stuff to the soil and let it chill out. What I would do, I mean, what's happening is the pine shavings. Yes, they have antimicrobial compounds. That's why we build with pine. Um, they also take a long time. They take a lot of they suck up a lot of nutrients and they create acidity. And you need to get a soil test and find out what the, what the acidity of that soil is. Because I'll bet you that it's like 4.8 or something. And nothing can grow in that, okay? I mean, there's plants that can grow in that, but they're not tomatoes, okay? So what you want to do is find out what the soil pH is and then ask your soil water conservation district how much lime you need to add to neutralize that acid. And I would, you know, get a, I would, you just put that one little bit of fish emulsion there, put a lot more fish emulsion on there and get that, that, those pine shavings cooking. And that's what I would do. Get a lot, find out what the pH is, correct the pH, put a lot more uh, nitrogen on there to break that down and try again. But maybe stop adding stuff without knowing more about it. 
Um, you know, we're, we're just kind of guessing. And really, somebody can tell you what's going on with that soil if you just take a soil test. And the way to take a soil test is to dig away some of the stuff and go down about that deep and get up about six inch sample of soil from various locations, mix it up, send in a handful to a &L Labs or somebody like that and ask them to do a micro and macronutrient analysis with pH and, and you're gonna see, and I'll bet, you, I'll bet you dimes to donuts that you have a very low pH. And that's a common problem. Even in this, in this climate generally, soils are kind of acidic because it's pretty wet around here. So you should all get a soil test and find out what the soil pH is. It's 35 bucks or something. You know, spend the money on the soil and on the compost and on getting a soil test and then getting a little advice from the West Multnomah Soil Water Conservation District and put a little fertilizer on there if you need it, but maybe you don't. Otherwise, you're just guessing. And that, and that, that, that it just isn't, isn't going to yield anything. And as a follow-up, I'll say that someone else asked about... Uh, where to get your soils tested. I shared the OSU extension link that has all the analytical labs in Oregon, which includes the uh, ANL lab that um, uh, James and, just- And mentioned. I'll tell you, whatever, wherever you live in the, in the world, if you're getting a soil test, make sure you get it done at a local soil test laboratory. You know, Oregon, if you're in Oregon, you could probably get it done anywhere, but you've got to tell them where you live because Different climates and different soils have different ways of reporting the data, different tests they do to give you the data. They make different assumptions about the rate at which nutrients are being released from the soil in Eastern Oregon than they do in the Western Oregon. So it's kind of, it sounds like it's subjective, but it's science, but it's very localized science. So when you send in a soil test, you make sure you want to don't send it to like Georgia or something because they have completely different models about how they report the data. And some of the labs, and I know there's many of them, and I am I a government employee? I guess I am. But a and Labs, they will give you a, a histogram, kind of a readout of high, medium, and low of all the nutrients. And they'll also, for a few, like 10, 15 more bucks, they'll, they'll give you a recommendation. And that's probably worth the ten fifteen dollars. I think as a university employee, I think you're allowed to give more recommendations than we are. So well, I'm uh, completely under the radar, and nobody pays attention to what I'm doing anyway. Here, here's a here's the next question. We'll see if we can get through a few more of these before our time's up. But uh, can you grow veggies and plants in just organic matter? Uh, compost without clay and loam is that a bad idea? Where are the it is a bad idea. Um, and 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 the reason that is is because uh, the, the mineral nutrients, you know, they're important. And yeah, they're present in organic matter, but, and stability. And when a root goes down into some organic matter, if it gets to be a big plant, it's just going to fall over in the wind. Where if it's down into the, into, the, into the minerals, and that's what they want. And that's where the water is. And that's where the nutrients are. And there's a different temperature. It's cooler down there. And the roots you know, are adapted to being in mineral soils, unless they're plants that are adapted to living in all organic matter. You know, that, there are plants like that, but they're not tomatoes, right? Now, you know, so trust that you have pretty good soil. Get a soil test, find out, get the app, find out what your soil is and see what the CEC is, right? So don't, don't be tempted with the, it's all, it's all about organic matter. It's all about everything. It's all about soil, actually, okay? And soil, to be soil, it has to have minerals, organic matter, air, and water, right? And if you don't have the minerals, is it soil? I don't think so. It's a soil-like substance. Okay. All right, let's, let's try this next one. Uh, um, based on the information you provided, I guess, uh, how do you know what plants grow best in a particular soil? Well, there are extension publications on that. And um, you know what's a really cool resource is the Portland, um, the Portland Nursery Veggie Guide. I don't know if you've ever seen that thing. But it tells you the spacing and when you plant things in the calendar and the best time, you know, and when to plant things and whether to transplant them or whether to direct seed them. So what was the question again? It was kind of more like, what, how do you determine the best plants for your soil? Well, um, 
you know, you got to ask people. You really do because there's traditional information that you know, ask your neighbor because they may know things about the soul that nobody else knows in any publication, right? And so if it's a, if it, if it's a mollusol, which you can look up, right, then it can probably grow almost anything. As long as you get the pH right, so check the pH, and as long as you get a little soil test and get some re recommendations, you can probably grow just about anything that normally would grow around. So not a great answer, but kind of a, a complicated question, really. Yeah, you grow a lot in, in Oregon, so yeah, there's a lot of factors involved, I would say. And Oregon State University Extension is, is what uh, James, so if you Google, you know, a various plant and Oregon State University Extension, you you can most likely get a guide if it's broccoli or corn or whatever. Right. The, um, the center for the center for small farms here at Oregon State yeah. University, super cool. If you actually are serious about trying to grow something a little more than just a small patch, contact them. They have workshops. They have all sorts of materials. Uh, the Center for Small Farms at Oregon State University, and they can put you in touch with all of the, the resources. But really join the master gardeners or something like that, you know, and hang out with these wonderful people who have been doing it for dozens of years, if not dozens of decades <laughs> or pretty close to it. And they know, and they'll have sales and they'll give you their plants and they'll tell you everything about it. And it's such a cool group of people, these, the, the, the master gardeners. And it, you know, it used to be mostly retired folks, but that's not really the case anymore. It's a lot of young people involved because everybody, not everybody, but more people than ever are starting to get it. That we have to like step up in and come in off the ledge a little bit and simplify a little bit and really focus on what matters and where your place is in it. And it's in the soil and you belong. You belong to the soil. You are of this earth. And once you internalize that, and once you start to grow your own feed, food, you realize that all the stuff that you were hoping to get and stuff really isn't as important as just simply belonging, right? And the, the struggle for status kind of just doesn't really matter once you realize that it's almost like we live in a giant solar system. You know what I mean? It's like there's a giant ball of fire out there and we're floating around it on a rocky planet that has liquid water. And because liquid water dissolves rocks and releases nutrients, here we are in this moment in the history of the cosmos together talking about it. And that is worth any amount of status. That, cause that is, those are, that's a fact. Those are facts. And before I leave you, I do wanna show you one thing that Yes, you too can buy this shirt. That's right. I sell these shirts. Oops, where is it? Oh no, hang on. I gotta get back to that. Dang it. You know, I thought I had this beautifully timed, but not that beautifully. Here it is. Right? And I have them in ladies and in gender neutral and all sizes. And you just go to soilforward.org. And 100% of the profits of these t shirts go to fund my internships. I've had over 120 paid internships through the sale of fruits and veggies. And I've added these t-shirts and we sell enough of these t-shirts that I can give one or two more internships than I could just selling fruit and veggie. And that has changed the lives of students. Young people want to grow stuff. Young people want to learn about soil. And you can participate in that by helping me help them by just simply wearing, I'm gonna tell you right now, if you wear this shirt in Portland, you gotta be prepared for people coming up to you and screaming, soil! And like, there's, it's a cult and you are gonna become a member, okay? And I'm telling you right now, I also have them in Klingon and in Vulcan because Klingons need soil too and so do Vulcans because they eat. And where does the energy come from? The sun. Okay, now you can buy them in Klingon and in Vulcan. So soil, right? You see that? Ladies and gender neutral. So won't you please help the kids? Come on. They have to, they have inherited this planet. 
and we are all responsible in some degree and we got to help them. And if all we can do is just show them how, what soil is and how to grow their own food, they can probably figure out the rest without us and maybe even better off without us. So help the kids, buy a shirt, start a garden. <laughs> That's great. Uh, uh, just to follow up, I know there was a lot more questions in the, in the Q&A. Uh, I think the, the two things, I, you know, I'll, I'll uh, reiterate what uh, James said about Masher Gardeners. Great resource. Every county has a hotline. Um, I don't know in the age of COVID exactly how it works, but usually the, you can call folks up you know, during normal business hours, Monday through Friday, and if they they'll answer your questions about anything gardening, soils, plants, you know, na you know, native uh, landscape, garden plants, uh, and if they don't know the answer, they'll find the answer and get back to you. And it's a it's a super awesome resource that folks. Um, Otherwise, uh, I'll share my uh, email in the chat and if folks uh, want to follow up with some additional questions, if there's anything I can't answer, I'll, I'll see if I can uh, plug uh, James to help me with the answer. So thanks everyone. Uh, yeah, we had over, we got up to 100 participants that were really excited about soil and I can't be more excited. So thanks again, James. Bye. Bye everyone. <laughs> Good luck out there. <laughs> Grow your own food. Don't forget. It's all about soil and you belong. <laughs>